All right. So we'll get started with just some introductions and everything as some folks join in. Uh, please keep in mind throughout the session that if you have any questions, we would love to hear from you in our Q&A function. Um, so you can drop questions into that Q&A box, and I'll be passing them along to our panelists as we go. You can also turn on closed captioning um, as part of your Zoom menu if that would enhance your accessibility experience. Uh, so again, welcome everyone to our session of Liquid Margins today. My name is Christy DeCarolis. I'm a customer success manager here at Hypothesis and an instructional designer. Um, and I also adjunct and use Hypothesis in my own courses. Um, but really, I'm just serving as our MC for the day. Um, and we have two panelists that are joining us, and I will let them introduce themselves. Um, Kristen, do you mind uh, starting with a quick introduction? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Palazzato. And uh, as you can see on the slide, I'm at Kingsborough Community College in New York City. Um, and our campus is right on the ocean, like it's 50 feet from my window here, <laughs> although it's terrible weather today. Um, and I'm really happy to be here and share my experiences using Hypothesis. Thanks so much for joining, Kristen. Yeah, I'm in New Jersey in the East Coast. Really, I feel like it's been raining here for like, I don't know, two weeks straight. <laughs> uh, Francie, do you mind introducing yourself? Uh, hi, I'm Francie Quosberryman. I teach at Cerritos College, which is in Southern California. So I'm on the opposite side of the country right now. Um, uh, I think I said I teach English. Um, yeah, there. Thanks so much. Hopefully it's not raining so much there. <laughs> no, it's very sunny, although I'm heading your way in a couple of days. So I hope it's sunny when I get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully it'll clear up a little bit. All right, so now that we've done our introductions, I'm gonna stop my screen share so we can dive into our discussion about hypothesis. Um, so uh, I first just wanna start out by getting a sense of how you've used hypothesis in your courses um, before we get into results. Um, so. Francie, since you went second for introductions, do you mind just sharing um, what problems you were hoping to solve with Hypothesis? Like, why did you turn to Hypothesis in the first place? When I first tried out Hypothesis, it was in my readings and drama class. And when I was originally scheduled to teach the class, it was pre-pandemic. So I wasn't expecting to teach it online. Um, and the first semester, quite honestly, was a disaster. I, I wasn't using Hypothesis at the time. I was trying to just do regular discussion boards. So they were reading in one place and then discussing the text in another place. And the engagement was low. It was just, it was miserable. And then uh, the next year, but before I taught it the next time, uh, I was introduced to Hypothesis. And it was really a game changer because the discussion wasn't happening separately from the reading. They had the reading. And they could, I could post resources for them to help them understand how to read the play. And then they could discuss the play in the same space. So I was able to layer resources and the discussion together. And it transformed the, the engagement in that process. Um, so that was how I got started with it. Okay. Uh, while we're on that subject, can you explain a little bit more how you integrate it into your courses? Do you like do you use it with every reading that the students are doing? Or you do you just use it in very specific instances? So now uh, I'm using it. I use it for all kinds of things. Um, obviously, in the, the drama class, we're reading the plays using that. Uh, but I'm in my freshman comp class. I I am using it with the readings. I'm using it with uh, YouTube videos that they're watching. I'm having them uh, review the syllabus. Uh, on hypothesis so they can ask questions on the syllabus. I'm having them read the essay prompts that way. So I'm using it for all kinds of things now. Uh, and again, all, all my classes are online. 
So um, it's a way for me to answer questions for everyone, especially when we're looking at the essay prompts, I can answer questions for everyone in that space so everyone can see the answers. Um, I can also see if they're focusing on the things I want them to focus on. And if they're not, I can say, hey, I didn't see anybody commenting on this, um, but I wanna bring that to your attention. So it's a way for me to monitor what they're focusing on as they're reading. It's a way to engage in a conversation about their reading. It's just, there's so many things you can do with it. Um, yeah, I, I can't imagine teaching without it at this point. <laughs> I totally agree. Thanks for sharing. Uh, and Kristen, what about you? What problems were you hoping to solve with Hypothesis? What made you turn to the tool? So um, other people on my campus faculty had been using this tool and there was a little bit of buzz. And I was like, oh, okay, Hypothesis must be definitely STEM related. <laughs> right? But it wasn't at all. And so at first I was <laughs> like, oh, okay, well, I don't need, we don't annotate in this class, right? But then as we were merging from the pandemic and I realized that, you know, something terrible happened just to these poor students during this pandemic and they were really struggling to climb back out of this hole. And, um, you know, we're doing, we went not back to fully in person, but back to hybrid classes. So they didn't have me as this like live guide. Let's read this little section together or let's discuss this. Uh, um, they just saw me in lab and that was it. And they were just struggling with this material because they needed to discuss it and talk and discussion group was not the way to do that. I'm sure a lot of you have had that experience <laughs> with discussion groups on the learning management system. So. Um, I took, I think it was the first cohort that Christy did this Hypothesis Academy. It was like two years ago now. Anyway, whenever it was, a year ago maybe. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this could really solve that problem of a way to discuss the material and interact about it that could actually work virtually. Not like the, dis I don't know why the discussion board wasn't the way I envisioned, but it wasn't. So I thought, let me try this because it's very user friendly and um, it's quick for students. And kind of like Francie was saying, when you're reading is when you're you're responding, like in your head usually. But if you can make the notes right there to the other people and the instructor, that's much better than having to remember it later in class to bring it up anyway, or to write it in a separate notebook. So that's the problem I was looking to solve is that kind of engagement and interaction when you're not together that gets the same result that, that you get when you are together. So that was my <laughs> journey to starting using it. So, okay, so it sounds like Francie is teaching online courses and you're teaching hybrid courses. Did you notice that the annotations impacted your in-person meetings at all um, after the students were annotating? Yes. So uh, first of all, they were getting to know each other a little better, which was almost like, I didn't think that would happen. I thought, oh, you, you get to know people when you're sitting next to them in lab and working on something together. And they did, but they, I would hear them referring back to a conversation they'd been having on hypothesis and like extending it when they came into lab and were working. Or, oh, did you see so-and-so posted a video about this that can help explain it better? if you look on the, the PowerPoint we were annotating or whatever. So that was really nice that it was, and that's what kind of convinced me, oh, this really is an interaction. They're not, I was grading it. It was for a grade, the, the annotations, but um, they were doing it for other reasons too, which is what I wanted, not just to get those points. That's great that they're kind of bringing it in. I guess it's similar to like them getting to know each other on like Snapchat or TikTok or whatever the the hot social media of the day is. I don't know. I don't even know at this point. Um, so uh, to kind of go back to those particular conversations and hypothesis, when I talk to faculty, I hear a lot about it can be difficult to get students to make meaningful annotations and to have conversations that are gonna impact their learning. 
Um, Francie, what kinds of prompts uh, or instructions do you typically give to students in order to make those successful conversations happen? So I, I also did the um, Hypothesis Academy. So I've used a lot of the strategies that I got from that. So um, my favorite one is the the sit responses. So they have to identify something surprising, um, something interesting and something troubling or tricky. Um, so I've used that one a lot. I also, I do have um, word count requirements on the responses and they have, so, and they have a certain number they have to do. Um, but one of the things I tried to do to kind of relax them a little bit about that is I just did, here's what you know, 50 words looks like, here's what 100 words look like, here's what 25 words looks like. So they could see it's not really that much. If you just have a thoughtful response, you could pretty easily come up with that word count. So don't get hung up on the word count. Try to think about what do I think about this and trying to push them to think more deeply about that. Um, so that's usually how I get them engaged in the readings and drama class. I do push them to engage throughout the play. I have had students who they, they're just hoop jumping and okay, I got my couple of things in, but I'm also not giving full credit for that. It, you know, I want to see that you're engaging with the whole play. Um, and once they do that, and and I can, and this this last week was fun. We were reading um, the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime, and it's a mystery. And as things were happening, you know, they were trying to make predictions because we were focusing on foreshadowing, and they were trying to make predictions. And then when they got to some of the reveals, then they got crazy in the comments. And it was fun to watch that interaction happen. As they were, oh my gosh, I didn't expect to see that happening either. Oh, you know, and I really appreciated seeing that level of engagement with the play. So the requirements help, but it, once they can get engaged in the material, I think sometimes in it, like you were saying, Christian, it kind of takes on a life of its own. Yeah, so, and you also mentioned that uh, sometimes you'll go and like add your own annotations to add additional resources or context. Um, do students typically like reply to those or are they just like standalone? Um, and do students ever bring in outside resources as well? Uh, yes. Um, so in the readings and drama class, I am trying to help them understand how to read the plays. So there's, um, I'm trying to show the structure. Here's the structure of the play uh, for this particular play. Here's some things to watch for. Look, I, you can see it happening right here. Um, so I do add that. I also add a lot of resources. A lot of the plays we're reading are based on actual historical events. So I provide a lot of resources that will help them make those connections and see those connections. Um, and I encourage them, hey, if you find a link to a production or if you find you know somebody doing a monologue or performing this, yes, share that video with us. And they do. Um, so I always appreciate that. I don't participate so much in the discussions in the English 100 because I'm trying not to sway because they're persuasive topics and I don't want to sway their thinking about those one way or the other. I really want them to be free to discuss those ideas. Um, so in the first reading I have them do, I, I do have questions and I show them how to do things, but it's me demonstrating here's what it looks like and mm -hmm. giving them space to respond. But once they've learned how to use the tool, then I kind of stay out of it a little bit more. Um, until we're doing the responses, because we'll do the initial post and then we'll have another time uh, space to do the responses to those. And then I'll get in and comment a little bit, uh, but I'm trying to be a little bit hands off in there. Um, I'm much more engaged in the drama class because we're discussing the text in a different way. Yeah, that definitely makes sense to change the way you're interacting, depending on what the goals for the particular text are. Um, Kristen, I heard you mention in an earlier comment something about students annotating PowerPoints. Um, what types of documents do you typically have students annotating and what kinds of instructions do you give them in order to get them to make annotations that are meaningful or helpful for their learning? Yeah, so it's funny that I threw that out there because that's the type of document they least often annotate. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't like PowerPoints that much for my for what we're doing. But um, I start, like Francie said, I st 
started with the syllabus, which is not when I first used hypothesis, that's not what I was doing. But now I do. I ended up taking a professional development seminar on equity and we revamped our syllabi. And, and then um, one of the things I wanted to do was have student input into the syllabus so that used hypothesis to do it. So that was one type of document. And then uh, videos that are short that are about a particular concept for the week. And then uh, uh, I have a list of very detailed learning objectives for each week. And I've had them annotate that. And um, sometimes I have them annotate research articles like primary literature or even an article from the newspaper that relates to our topic for the week. So whatever, <laughs> I feel like the possibilities are endless. I keep finding new new things they can do with hypothesis. <laughs> um, as far as, as helping them to make a, a comment that's adding to their learning, uh, in the in the Hypothesis Academy, there were a lot of example assignments, and I borrowed heavily from those first. And what surprised me so much, because of my experience with discussion boards, where you had to keep repeating the rubric, even though it was like brief and clear, <laughs> they just weren't earning the points because they weren't saying anything too substantive or whatever. With with the instructions we had from Hypothesis they seem to get it instantly, the whole class, not just that upper third that, you know, things come easy for, but everyone understood how to make a comment that was substantive or, or that was a question or that was a disagreement with the previous. It was so easy for them. And so I just keep using those same, you know, modified a little bit to fit my classes instructions that I got in the very first Hypothesis Academy and the students are doing it brilliantly. And then they take off on their own, like we've been saying, and they, then you don't have to worry at all. They, they make it their own. And Francie mentioned a couple of different approaches with how much she participates in the annotations. Um, what do you tend to do? Do you kind of like let the students go off on their own conversations or do you go in and like model uh, annotations, especially with like research articles and things like that? Yeah, totally. Like you said, totally depends what it is. Um, but I haven't found that I, I always kind of check as they're getting started with something or they, you know, not quite sure what to say or, but it, I haven't found that I need to say much. And lately I start just scanning for the spots where someone's saying maybe the professor can chime in when they're not sure of an answer. <laughs> right? And that's the only place I need to say anything half the time. <laughs> so, but if, if we're like working on the syllabus together, then I have a lot more to say back to them. So it just depends what kind of, um, you know, activity we're engaged in. Yeah, that makes sense. And the thing that's most intriguing for me and kind of connects to, uh, I think that the case study we'll look at a little bit more later um, is how you had them annotate learning objectives. What types of annotations are they making when, when they're reviewing those learning objectives? So uh, I used, I don't remember the acronym, but some kind of acronym. So they could do <laughs> one of four or five things, right? So either they were going to, right, that the, the learning objectives are worded kind of like an exam question, like a short essay. They could just answer it in their own words, which I was like, eh, I'm just gonna ask AI to do it. But <laughs> it doesn't seem like many of them did. But, um, or they could ask a clarifying question about it, or they could bring in an outside resource to post that they thought was good for explaining that objective. And those are only three, but there were like four things they could do um, in response to that to, to get their credit. And it's usually a list of like 10 or 12 objectives for the week. And they had to um, post five, five annotations and respond to a couple of other people's, something like that. Okay, great. That sounds like it'll be an interesting, that's one thing I haven't had my students do yet is annotate learning objectives. So. I'm like trying to get my own ideas here too. <laughs> it was okay. It, the only problem with that was I should have done it in groups because uh, when you got only 12 objectives for the week and there's 20 people commenting, they can't come up with enough new stuff to say and it's very messy. It's not, not very functional. Um, 
and I didn't have them. I didn't have them do that the next semester. But if I did it again, it would definitely be in smaller groups. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, great. So we have heard about kind of how you've been using hypothesis in the classroom. Um, Francie, can you talk a little bit about the changes you've seen in your own teaching style and in student learning in your courses since you started using Hypothesis? My teaching style? Um, if any, I, it could be nothing. <laughs> no, um, I think, I think that the with the reading and the changes in the reading that there's that there's just more engagement with it um because before okay some i'm not going to have a discussion board about everything um i would have you know sometimes have them read things and then it, it's you're going to use it later but we're not going to necessarily do anything with it now and i know full well when i do that nobody's reading it they're just not um so I think now, because I am having them engage in some way with all of the texts, that that's been a big change. Um, and so it's also trying to balance the workload, um, knowing that now I'm asking them to engage in the text. So it is going to take longer for them to go through this particular reading. So maybe I trim it down and we don't read quite so many things. We just focus more deeply on a couple of things that are going to really help us develop the essays that we're going to develop. Um, and then with the readings and drama class, it's completely different because, um, again, before I, the resources would be there, but they weren't, I wasn't showing them where the resources connected to the text, where now I can show them exactly where those resources connect to the text. Um, because before, Olga, okay, the resources would be over here and they're on a list and they're available for you to look at and I'll have information about how they connect, but you still have to make that that leap. Um, and so now I can make it right there for them. Yeah, and sometimes I always wonder if it's like separate. Will they actually go click on it? But if no. it's something <laughs> that they need when they're reading, maybe if it's right there, they'll actually click because they're like, oh, this could help me understand. Um, so do you, this might, I'm not sure how difficult this might be to kind of assess with fully online courses, but do you feel like the interactions among your students have changed with hypothesis? Well, it, from what I see online, I would say yes. I, I don't, while there are still definitely students who are hoop jumping for points, I also see that there are students who are genuinely engaged in the dialogue. Um, where I, when it was on the discussion board, it, I just, it all felt like hoop jumping. It's, you know, here's my post, here's my two, two responses, and then that was it. But now I see far more students who are going above and beyond what the minimum expectation is and really engaging with their classmates. And I can see it because it's so easy to see. Um, and like you were talking about uh, answering questions too, the tags make that so much easier because I can go, I encourage them to use the tags, you know, so they can put question or whatever. And uh, then it's easier for me to go through and spot those um, and respond quickly to any questions that pop up. Yeah, I think that's probably the most frequent use of the tags that I see is people trying to, um, you know, really easily surface the questions that come up. Um, so if you haven't used those before, Kristen, that might be a good thing to explore in the future. I was just thinking that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what about you, Kristen? Has anything about your teaching approach uh, changed since you started implementing Hypothesis? Uh, yeah. So uh, because I'd done the shotgun approach, let's use Hypothesis for everything. I could see now how students were engaging with the various resources. And so they always had a textbook, but I never knew how they engaged with it. And now I can see. So they, the textbook's online, they can annotate, and I can see um, <laughs> kind of how much they really like it or get out of it more than I ever could before. Um, and also which parts of it speak to them and which parts seem kind of useless to all of that. And kind of skipping to make this story short, I, I'm, 
I wasn't so sure the textbook was as valuable as I thought it was and as valuable as they think it is. Right? They, they would die if they didn't have a textbook, but the truth is they wouldn't. They just feel like you've got to have a textbook. Um, but for me, that was an eye opener. I'm like, hmm, I'm not sure we really need a textbook in this class. In fact, I'm, I'm not sure it's not making things harder for them to learn what I'm really getting at. They're trying to just memorize a bunch of details instead. Anyway, so that was a big change for me. And I really de-emphasize the textbook now. It's still there because they would die if I didn't give them one. <laughs> but um, there's no like graded assignments based on the textbook. And I say right in the syllabus, uh, these are the resources we have for mastering learning objectives. So the same set of resources every week. Textbook is one of them, but notice that it's not at the top. If you like it, by all means, use it, but you don't have to, do, it's free anyway, but you don't have to use it to do well in this class. So that, that was a big change for me to see how, to see how a textbook works for students. Yeah, that does sound like a big change. And I know you already mentioned how you saw a change in student engagement in class because of the annotations they were doing outside of class as well. Um, so I'm wondering, cause we, we both, you, both of you mentioned um, rating briefly and this is something that I get a lot of questions about when I talk to faculty, cause there's so many different ways you can use hypothesis to also so many different ways you could grade annotations. Um, do you mind sharing, Kristen, how you decide or choose to grade the annotations in your course? Sure. So, so far, I've always attached some points to them. Um, it just depends what it is. Like, even for the syllabus, I wanted them to chime in with their ideas. So I made it two points, something small. Um, but they'll do it. They like points. <laughs> um, and then because it's integrated with the LMS, it's pretty easy. The only, actually, I, maybe you've already fixed this because I know it was on the list. Um, the, the default points were always the same. Like I could make it whatever points I wanted, but on hypothesis, it was always 10 or 20, something like that. So that was a little annoying, but not even, that wasn't even that annoying. <laughs> so um, I just would grade did they do what I said in the rubric they should? Okay, so it doesn't matter if the comments were long or short or whatever, did they do the 10 I asked and it wasn't just, um, oh, that's really cool or thank you, right? Or good job. And because I needed time to get through all of that grading. So uh, if I'm tr trying to say more to them, I've realized I have to assign less. So if, if I wanna make it sort of based on articles that we're gonna go into deeply, where I really wanna have a conversation, it's gonna take a lot longer to, to assess their work. And so maybe I do five of those a semester and not all the annotations of learning objectives and stuff. I'm still kind of finding that balance for grading. But, uh, you know, from the technical side, it's really easy. Hypothesis has made it really easy. It's well integrated to the LMS. Yeah, that makes sense. And I'll have to follow up with your school to see if they are on the correct version to get that change where the point value should be whatever you make it now. It yeah, <laughs> I'm, afraid is, that been it's been <laughs> I'm not teaching this semester, so I'm not quite sure. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what about you, Francie? How do you tend to assess the students with their annotations? For the, um, because they're English classes, I do need to see that they're writing. So um, they have word count minimums that they have to do. Um, and then uh, there's a specific number of posts that they have to do, uh, posts and then responses to classmates. Um, but they're, they're very quick to grade. Um, Again, I get more involved in the uh, readings and drama class because that's more of a discussion. So I am, am in there responding to them. But in the freshman comp class where they're reading through an article they're gonna later use for an essay, I can very quickly glance at those, make sure they're on topic. Have they, uh, you know, does this meet the word count requirement? And was it generated by AI? 
Uh, so I, every once in a while, I'll pull them and check them. And yeah, no, dude. I don't know what you're doing. So uh, I do check those, um, but it you still use that part usually grades pretty quickly. It's when I'm involved in the discussion takes a little bit longer, but it's actually the fun part. So I enjoy that. Yeah, I've heard that from a lot of folks that um, they end up taking a while to grade annotations because they like reading the annotations. I find that with my own class too. I'm like, wow, they're really contributing some interesting thoughts, outside resources. Um, and I, I also find them enjoyable to read. So I definitely relate to that. Um, okay, so I know this session was titled um, around increasing grades and retention and student success. And we've been talking about all these other details so far. But I think all that stuff is important in kind of laying the foundation for how do we get those better grades and retention and success in our courses. So now that we know a little bit more about how you've used hypothesis, how you encourage students to annotate, and how you assess the annotations, I think we can start looking at the results of all of your experimentation. Um, so Kristen, do you mind getting us started? Uh, what results have you seen in your courses with regards to student grades and retention after using Hypothesis? Sure, thanks. Um, I was really surprised, I have to say, that it, it's true that I, I did other interventions at the same time, like the equity stuff that I was talking about, and um, I did my exams differently. But this was the biggest change from what I had been doing previously, and I didn't expect it to have the, the impact that it had. So the rates of withdrawal were the same. That didn't change as far as retention over those semesters before and after hypothesis. But um, the, the students who remained, the, the whole distribution shift in the grades, and suddenly I had like 10 people getting a, a plus out of out of you know 24 in the class and it was and i was like am i just being too easy on them no i don't think so <laughs> they're just really engaging more which is the whole point that's what i wanted because i knew if they did engage with the material and interact over it that they would understand it better in the way that i intended so um what what they were really good at students have always been good at is here's a bunch of words or concepts and i will tell you the meanings of them all the definitions that was not a problem for them or i will look up anything you want but it was very different to try to piece the concepts together into some kind of cohesive whole and also difficult to apply them to a little word problem for example and this is what they seem to be getting better at and i thought they would if they were if they were if they were giving and receiving more words of their own, then they would be able to do this on a test better than they had before, because I wasn't ever asking them to just spit out definitions like they wished I would. So um, I had that little, uh, you know, Kara wrote up that little case study and she made a graph of the data when I sent it to her to show how many more A's we were having than we had before. So the students, again, it didn't change retention really, didn't seem to, but it had a huge effect on students' final grade in the course. I think it was at, at least, you know, significantly due to this new tool. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, if for my educational geeks out there, Bloom's Taxonomy at the bottom, we have our basics like memorizing, things like that and hypothesis I think is letting our students kind of climb up into those higher higher order skills like our application skills and our evaluation skills and that's really what's going to allow them to do better on those summative assessments. Um, so thanks Kristen that sounds like you had a pretty good results in your class. Um, what about you, Francie, with, uh, in terms of student grades and retention, what kind of results did you see? So the, the most dramatic change was the first year. So the, 
like when the first year I was using hypothesis in the drama class, um, the previous semester, the pre well, I teach it once a year. So the previous year, um, the retention had been not good. The I mean, the grades were okay, but it, the class just dwindled to a very small group. Um, and the next year, it was still a small class to begin with, but uh, I had 100% retention in that class, which I've never had. And then uh, almost all of them had A's or B's. So that was kind of shocking. Um, and it's the retention has kind of gone up and down, but it's honestly for us right now, it's a little hard to judge because we're having a horrible problem with fake students. Um, and so it's a little hard right now to, de to determine who is a real person and who is not a real person. So the retention numbers are uh, kind of sketchy. But for the people I have right now, uh, they are they seem to all be real people and they are doing well. So I'm optimistic. It's just it our numbers are so strange right now because of this bot student problem we're having. That is an interesting problem I was not expecting to encounter <laughs> when asking that question. No, I don't think any of us are. And it's a very strange, uh, yeah, it's very strange right now. Yeah. Um, so I just want to point out, if for those who haven't checked the chat, um, they did post um, the case study from Kristen's course as well as from Francie's course regarding the uh, grades and retention and the results that we that they saw. So if you want to check out more details about those results, you can find the case studies linked in the chat. Um, I did also want to just quickly mention, someone asked, um, what tool do you use to check for AI or does Hypothesis offer such a tool? Um, right now, there is not a tool in Hypothesis that can check for AI um, most of what I've read is that AI detectors generally don't work. Um, I will say from my experience teaching that uh, if I think that I've come across something that's generated by AI, it's because the student has simply summarized something that is happening in the text, uh, which I explicitly ask them not to do. So they just don't get credit because they're not following the instructions of the annotation assignment because I'm asking them to do some kind of deeper analysis. I don't know if Francie or, or Kristen, if you have come across any similar situations. Um, I was just answering it in the Q and A and saying that that our student population here, at least, they their speech is very is varied for sure, but none of them sound like the way AI sounds when it comments on general biology, which is still, yeah. and, um, and it's, I'm not saying that I'm a great detector, D definitely not. But I, I wrote in the, in the Q and A that I think it would take longer for them to think up the right prompt for the sort of annotation I'm asking them to do than it would to just write their informal thoughts, which is what I want. Like, how did you yeah. respond to this? Or can you find objective three in this chapter or whatever it is? Um, that it would take longer to figure out how to ask AI to do that task than it would be to just try it. And it's it kind of low stakes the way I have it set up for grading. You're just really rewarded for trying and for sharing. So it seems to be working okay. What about you, Francie? And then also someone asked you to expand on what the bot student problem means. <laughs> oh, so, okay, well, there, there's two parts to that. <laughs> so it, it, the same kind of thing with, you can tell the difference between the student writing. Um, and and I've been very purposeful. I I did the, the hypothesis class on AI last summer. And so I've been very intentional about doing things in the prompts that you could only get from the class. So you can't just go out and, and ask an AI tool to give you this information because it's it's not gonna have it. Um, so like Kristen said, the responses don't match what you're asking them for. And then the writing style is very different. So it's not hard to spot. And then I'll just run it through a, a like if I suspect it, which is pretty high, you know, it's like, okay, it's not looking right. I'll run it through a, a detector. And if it comes up, then I'm, let's talk about this. 
Um, because I also have discovered that if they run it through something like Grammarly, it can come up as AI generated. So I usually talk to them. Um, and then we talk about, you don't just turn over your papers to the computer and let your the computer take ownership. So that's what I've been doing to try to deal with that. It's not perfect, but trying to talk to them about what's appropriate use and what's not appropriate use is, seems to be the way I'm going right now. Um, with the bot student thing, I don't understand it all. I just know that for some reason, and it's not just our school, it's a bunch of schools are having trouble with these students that are not real people. Somehow they have information, but they're not real people. So I, honestly, I don't have a lot of information about that. I just know why do I have all these people who are not real? And I don't know, it's a California thing, I guess, I don't know. Yes, all those bots in California. <laughs> It's, it's, it's horrible, oh honestly, God, from automated it's, cars to automated it's, people. It's, it's, it's really been quite horrible because then you, you find out, oh, this person's not real. And now your retention is abysmal because they kicked out all the people who were not real people. So I, it's a very strange thing. Yeah, that certainly sounds strange, but I'm um, not high enough up on the food chain to know exactly what's happening. <laughs> So to turn our attention back, our attention back to actual students. Yes, uh, we we heard how what kind of results you've had in your classes, um, and it sounds like you both are pretty enthusiastic about using Hypothesis. But how have your students responded? Do your students tend to like using Hypothesis? Ugh, can't talk today. Do they tend to like using Hypothesis? Do they have negative reactions to it? What what feedback have you on, if any? Um, do you mind starting with that, Kristen? Sure. Um, so I need to ask them that specifically, which I haven't done. Uh, but first of all, it's easy for them to use. I was amazed. I thought the first two weeks were going to be a disaster with technological questions. And no, it's completely user friendly and they figured it out all by themselves. Um, so that was good. But other than that, they haven't really commented, it's, which is I think that is a comment. It's so easy to use, it's transparent, if that makes sense. So they they don't have to even think about, oh, I'm using a tool now. They're just doing their thing, participating in class. And um, I, I think that they, they'll do whatever I ask them to do. <laughs> like I want the grade, <laughs> the tool you set in front of me, but obviously it's a good one if they're able to do that with ease. Yeah, that's so true. <laughs> what about you, Francie? Have you gotten any feedback from your students? Yeah, I do ask about it specifically when they do their end of the semester feedback. Um, and overall, the response is very positive, that they, they like that it's easy to use. They like the interaction. They like being able to see what their classmates have to say about the reading. They like the resources that are there for them. Um, so uh, overall, it's very positive. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I tend to think that sometimes students might not even realize that they're using something that's not technically part of the, the learning management system. Um, so you both have used Hypothesis in lots of different ways. So I'm not sure how you might <laughs> answer this last question because it sounds like you've kind of run the gamut in, on what you can use Hypothesis for. Um, but do you plan in future courses to make any changes on how you're using Hypothesis or are there, is there anything you want to try with Hypothesis in the future? Um, Francie, can you start with that one? I think no, until you all come up with some different things. Like one of the things <laughs> I would love to be able to do, uh, so I guess here's my wish list. One of the things I would love to be able to do is to get them to annotate my lecture videos, but all those are done in studio. And unless I upload them onto YouTube, which I don't really want to do, uh, they can't. So there's my wish list. I would love to be able to have them annotate those, not all of them, but some of those lecture videos out of studio. So there, hint, hint. Uh, so, but otherwise, I, I at this moment, I feel like I've kind of maxed it out until I think of something else. So I'm not planning any big changes. So that might be on our roadmap, but 
I'm not going to say anything official here. Oh, look, I see it in the <laughs> chat. <laughs> okay, maybe it's okay if I say it then. <laughs> what about you, Kristen? Is there anything new that you want to try in the future with Hypothesis? Yes. So now um, I'm having students, I've just sort of started playing around with this. I'm having students write the exam themselves. Ooh. And, um, and we're trying to, you know, workshop it and discuss it ahead of time or after one or the other or both. And I, I didn't use hypothesis to do it. It was a combination of discussion board and in-class discussion, but I, I was like, hypothesis would be much better for this. So um, that's the next thing I want to do. And I have been loving, I don't know if they love writing their own exam, but I have been loving it. I'm like, these are good questions. They're different <laughs> every semester. So that's my plan. Do you think, do they try to make the questions really easy or really hard? Um, they, it depends on the student. Like some of them are like, this is the kind of question I would like to have. And I'm like, well, no. <laughs> make it harder than that and then it, some others of them are like "Ooh, a competition for who can write the hardest questions <laughs> so we get a whole range and I guess on the flip side since you also have tried using hypothesis in lots of different ways um were there any lessons learned in how you implemented it like if you were to give advice to someone who was using hypothesis for the first time what might you, what, I don't know if that's two different questions. So feel free to you know, answer either angle there. <laughs> uh, what do you think, Kristen? Um, yeah, I already mentioned about uh, um, often, or thinking about the group size for whatever task you're doing. Um, and then the other thing would be, I think I did too much at the same time. Like it was hypothesis overload for the students who are like, oh, more annotating. So just to be really intentional about what tasks, because what goal do you have that you're really accomplishing by using this tool and not just, um, oh, here's another way that's easy to grade. <laughs> I can throw that in too. Anyway, that's what I would recommend. Yeah, the group size is something that comes up a lot and is also, I feel like, a hotly debated topic. Like people, I don't know, people will tell me so many different numbers that are the ideal number to annotate together. Uh, how many do you tend to have to annotate together in a, in a group, maybe outside of your learning objective one, Kristen? Um, it, it's... Depends how many I think might drop that semester. So if I think they're going to, I'll start it out with a group of six, but I don't want it to be less than three. Two is not ideal and four is better. So four or five is the, for me, that's the sweet spot. Okay. And is that the same for the learning objective annotation assignment? Yeah. Yeah. So if we're annotating a, a research article that's technical and difficult, fine to have the whole class my whole class is usually around 20 for me 15 to 20. okay um, but if they're going to do a lot of back and forth and and adding of resources and all that kind of thing at the group of four to five is much better what about you francie how big or small do you tend to keep your groups it depends a lot of times on the length of whatever they're annotating. If it's something short, I'm going to keep the groups smaller so that everybody has something they can comment on. Um, but for the drama class, they're all, it's no groups. They're just all in there discussing it together. Um, and then the other thing I try to do is once I see how they're responding and when they respond, I try to put early posters together because I am asking them to respond to each other. So if I know, hey, you're an early poster, let me get you in the group with the early posters so that you guys can get this done that I know you want it, you know, and then I'll put the other people in in a different group. So sometimes I'm moving the groups around. They don't stay static. The sem throughout the semester, I will move them around. I just learned you have to not move them after they've commented. Wait till <laughs> wait till there's a gap and then move them. Yes, 
That's a really great pro tip about putting the early annotators together and the later annotators together. Definitely take notes, anyone watching out there, because I haven't heard that one before, and I think it's a really uh, good suggestion. Um, so before we kind of roll into our final slides and announcements of the day, um, I want to give attendees a chance. Remember, please, you can put questions in the Q&A. And then uh, Francie and Kristen, was there anything I didn't ask that you just wanted to say about Hypothesis that you were hoping to share? The answer can be no. I just wanted to kind of put it out there. <laughs> if you're, if, so. oh, if you're, on, the, if you're mm -hmm. on the fence and trying to decide if it's something you want to try, definitely give it a try. It's it's worth, sure. it's it's a not a steep learning curve. It's easy to learn how to use. It's easy for the students to learn how to use, and it's easy to integrate into your class. So give it a try. For sure. And I was going, just going to repeat what was said earlier about how it's fun to read all their comments, and it's hard not to want to answer a whole bunch of things. Like, you could spend hours. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree, obviously. Yes, and some people are asking about the recording. The recording will be sent out. Um, and just to wrap up our last few minutes, I just want to share um, some resources that are uh, coming up and where you can find more information. Uh, both Kristen and Francie talked about Hypothesis Academy. If you're a partner school with Hypothesis, you have access to taking this course, um, our social annotation in the age of AI course. Uh, that course is launching today. So if you register today, you can still join. Um, and our next cohort of Social Annotation 101 is launching in April, if you want to check that out. You'll get lots of assignment ideas in addition to learning how to use Hypothesis um, and lots of feedback from me in case you just want to hear me more. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who are not partners with Hypothesis, you can check out our Kickstart promotion um, and you'll get a few things as part of this promotion included a discounted pricing um, and access to that Hypothesis Academy, as well as some other goodies. So please reach out to the email on the screen if you're interested in learning more uh, about getting access to Hypothesis at your school. Um, we also have a big event coming up next month. Uh, we have a conference, a virtual conference that is free, no cost, on April 17th and 18th, 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern time, both days. So we're going to have lots of folks sharing, much like people are today, about how they use social annotation in their courses. I know people are asking about social annotation in specific subjects in the Q&A. We're definitely going to have lots of different disciplines represented there if you want to see how folks are using um, social annotation in different levels of education, in different subjects, lots of different ideas to be learned. 18th, uh, 17th and 18th of April, 12 to 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, so I believe I closed my chat window, but you can find more information and register at the link in the chat. Um, so that's everything we have for the day today. I'm so glad that you all were able to join. Thank you especially to our panelists, Kristen and Francie, for sharing their experiences and the results. It was so good to see both of you again. Um, and if there's anything we can do to help, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at Education at Hypothesis. So I hope everyone has a great rest of your week. And thanks again for joining today, everyone.